Jesus taught us, saying, There is no need to be afraid, little flock, for it has pleased your Father to give you the kingdom. Today we're going to start a new sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, with a few breaks for Christmas and the Holy Spirit encounter, this should take us into the end of February, maybe into March. Uh, but today we're starting on the Beatitudes. And uh, Carla is going to come and read uh, the Beatitudes for us. Actually, two versions. One from Matthew, first of all from Matthew, and then from Luke. Before she reads them, I want to tell you, middle class people like us prefer Matthew's version. Poor people, people on the outside, people who are ostracized prefer Luke's version. So I want you to listen carefully to these and feel the difference. And uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But Carla, come and read for us. These are the Beatitudes, first from Matthew and then from Luke. Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. In the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <clears throat> Luke six twenty to 26 Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. For that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. So do you hear the difference? Do you, do you feel the difference? Now I heard recently of a young fellow who just loved eating ice cream. But he developed this bad habit of taking the bowl and licking the bowl out after he's finished eating. And no matter what his mother did, she couldn't get him to stop licking out the bowl. And one day she came up with a new tactic and she said, as he's looking out the bowl, she says, you know, when I was your age, my mom told me that it was really impolite to lick out your bowl. And he responded without a blink. He says, well, mom, no worries. You can lick out your bowl today because I don't mind at all. Now, sometimes when people are trying to tell us something, we misunderstand. And I think that's the way it has been with the Beatitudes. We've misunderstood what Jesus is intending. We've been told that the Beatitudes paint a picture of the ideal Christian, that these are traits that we are, are supposed to uh, try to emulate. But I don't believe that is what Jesus is teaching at all. Rather, I believe that Jesus' teaching through the, king, through the Beatitudes is this, that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is available to everyone, including us. It's available to you no matter how badly you think about yourself or how badly others think about you. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus begins to proclaim his message. 
And verse 17 summarizes Jesus' main message. He says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And as a result, what happens? A few verses down, sick folk were soon coming to be healed from as far away as Syria. And whatever their illness or pain, and pain or if they were possessed by demons or were insane or were paralyzed, he healed them all. Enormous crowds followed him wherever he went. Now, I believe the Beatitudes are kind of a show-and-tell approach of Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of heaven coming near that is drawing near. People, the people in the Beatitudes are the very people standing in front of Jesus, the people he was healing, the people he, were, he was teaching, the very people who had received from the heavens through his ministry. He could po- point out in the crowd These very people who are now blessed because the kingdom has come near. The kingdom has just reached out and touched them through Jesus' heart and through his hands. And so they are blessed. So what is Jesus saying by blessed are the poor in spirit? He is saying blessed are the spiritual zeros. The spiritually bankrupt, the deprived, the deficient, the spiritual beggars. Those without a wisp of religion, when the kingdom of heaven draws near, comes upon you. The poor in spirit are blessed as a result of the kingdom of heaven coming, being available to them in the midst of their spiritual poverty. In the crowd around Jesus are people with no spiritual qualifications, no spiritual abilities. You would never call upon them when there's spiritual work to be done. There is nothing about them to suggest that the breath of God is about to work through them. There's no charisma, no religious clout. They don't know their Bibles. They don't know the law. They're just lay people who can maybe fill the pew and maybe fill an offering plate. But no one asks them to lead a service or lead in prayer. Dallas Willard tells the story of a, of a missionary who in northern Mexico. And his approach was to lead Bible studies. And what he would do is read a passage of Scripture, and then he would just ask the people, uh, what do you think? And their response was absolute silence. Time after time again, he would read a passage and say, what do you think? And nobody would respond until he figured out. No one asks poor people what they think. No one imagines that they have any thoughts worth sharing. Real poverty in our world is almost automatically taken as a sign of failure in every respect. But Jesus says, blessed are the poor. Now back to the question of why do we like Matthew, Matthew's version, and the the poor, the outcasts, like Luke's version better? And the answer is because Luke's version is a lot harder to misunderstand. It's blunt. It says, blessed are the poor, period. Did you know that in many English translations in Matthew, the first beatitude is mistranslated on purpose, an attempt to make sense out of uh, something us middle class people can't or don't want to understand, but poor people clearly understand. Let me give you an example of some of the mistranslations. The first beatitude literally says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, the New English Bible, for example, adds a few words, and it's, uh, this is how they translated it at first. Blessed, who know, blessed are those who know that they are poor in spirit. Or a more recent translation, the New Living Version says, some of you may have it open right in front of you, it says, those who know that there is nothing good in themselves are happy. A clear mistranslation. Now, if Matthew wanted to say that, the Greek language has plenty of words that he could use. Why do we mistranslate it? This, this struggle to mistranslate reflects our need to find something good that we can do in order to be blessed, that we can somehow earn this blessedness. But that exactly misses the whole point of the Beatitudes. Jesus did not say, blessed are the poor in spirit because they are poor in spirit. He did not think 
what a fine thing it is to be destitute of every spiritual attainment or quality. The poor in spirit are called blessed because in their poor state, the rule of the kingdom has moved redemptively into their lives by the grace of God. The poor people in the crowd before Jesus are blessed only because of the gracious touch of God upon their lives. The mistranslations show our struggle with dealing with the fact that God simply blesses out of his grace, not because they've somehow attained some kind of spiritual quality. The Beatitudes are not teachings on how to be blessed. They are not instructions to do anything. They are just... Uh, they, they don't show conditions that are, are particularly pleasing to God and beneficial to human beings. No one is actually being told, you're better off for being poor. You're better off for being persecuted. Rather, the Beatitudes explain and illustrate the very people in front of Jesus who are now blessed because the kingdom of heaven has drawn near to them. That they, the kingdom of heaven is available to them through personal relationship with Jesus. No matter who we are and what, we are, we, uh, what we've done, we are blessed if and when we draw near to the kingdom of God in personal relationship with Jesus. The, the Beatitudes single out cases that provide proof that in Jesus... The rule of heaven is available to all of us, no matter who we are, no matter how hopeless our situations seem. The Beatitudes simply cannot be good news if they are a new list of things that we have to do and qualities we have to try to attain by ourselves. They would just be a new legalism. Now, if we look at Luke's Beatitudes, you find a list of four groups of people who are blessed. The poor, the hungry, the grief-stricken, those who are hated and hurt because of their association with Jesus. And again, these are the very people who are standing in front of Jesus, the people that he's teaching. Truly, it is difficult to make these, this kind of people look good. There's no mistranslations of Luke. None of our versions say this. Blessed are those who think that they are hungry. Mistranslating Luke just doesn't work. Jesus' point is this. The kingdom is available to all of humanity through reliance upon Jesus. His verse of Beatitude, Blessed are the poor in spirit, speaks to those who the religious system of his day has left on the outside. But Jesus says there's room for him, them in his kingdom. Now let's look at the other Beatitudes very quickly. The second one is, blessed are those who mourn, or as Luke refers to them, as the weeping ones. Blessed are the weeping ones. Men and women whose spouses have just deserted them, leaving them paralyzed by rejection. A parent in gut-wrenching pain because of the death of their little girl. People in the sunset years of their employable years who've just lost everything because the company in which they've invested their life has just gone bankrupt and they've not only lost their jobs, but they've lost their pensions. So many things to break the heart. But as we see, the kingdom enters into our lives, bringing comfort, and the tears turn to laughter. Next are the meek. These are the shy ones, the intimidated, the mild, the unassertive, the people who step off the sidewalk to let others pass because it only seems like the right thing to do. When things go wrong around them, they naturally assume that it's somehow their fault. When others step forward and speak up, they shrink back. They're not assertive. They don't even assert their legitimate rights. But as the kingdom of God enfolds them, the whole earth is their father's and is theirs as they need it. Next come those who burn with desire for things to be made right. 
Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. It may be that the wrong that they see is in themselves. Perhaps they have failed so terribly that they cringe day and night, hoping to be made pure again. Or maybe the wrong that they have suffered is a wrong against them. They suffered some kind of terrible injustice, and now they are consumed with a longing to see the injury sets, set right again. Like the parents of a murdered child whose murderer has been released early from prison, and he is now laughing at them. Yet the kingdom has the ability to transform the most terrible things in our lives so that they seem insignificant to the greatness of God. He restores our souls and fills us with goodness, the goodness of righteousness. Next are the merciful. The world says, woe to the merciful, because they're going to be taken advantage of. And outside of God's kingdom, that is what often happens. The merciful are always despised by those who know how to take care of business. Yet in the kingdom, they find mercy to meet their needs. And then comes, the next comes, the pure in heart. The ones for whom nothing is good enough, not even, not even themselves. These are the perfectionists. They are a pain to everyone, themselves maybe most of all. In religion, they will certainly find error with your doctrine, your practice, likely your heart and your attitude. But they are even harder on themselves. They endlessly pick at their own motivations, and yet... The kingdom is open to them. And at last in the kingdom, they will find what they were looking for, something that truly satisfies their pure heart, for they will see God. And when they do, they will find what they have been looking for, someone who truly is good enough. And then the peacemakers are there too. You see, outside the kingdom of God, the peacemakers are often called anything but the children of God. They're called everything else. Why? Because they're always in the middle, a dangerous place to be. Ask a police officer about domestic disputes. One of the most dangerous things for a police officer to, to respond to. Why? Because everybody knows they're not on your side. They're, they're looking at both sides. So how can they possibly be on my side? They're always in the middle. And then there are those who are attacked because they stand for what is right. They suffer sometimes in this world great persecution. Their lives are ruined and sometimes they're put to death simply by refusing to do what is wrong. And then last of all, those insulted and persecuted and lied about because they've gone off with their rocker and taken up with Jesus. That is certainly how his disciples were viewed. They actually think that this carpenter from Hicksville is the one who is sent to save the world. Come on, get real. From a human perspective, maybe this last group is the one most viewed as removed from God's blessing. Because as Jesus explained to his disciples, when they come after you, when they want to persecute you, when they want to kill you, they think they are doing God a favor. Because they think God is against them too. Now, I don't want you to miss what the Beatitudes are about. The point of the Beatitude is this, that Jesus opens the kingdom of heaven to everyone. Jesus in the Beatitudes is showing the principle that the last will be first and the first will be last. Many of those thought to be blessed in human terms are miserable and last in God's terms. And many of those as regarded as cursed and last in human terms may well be blessed and first in God's terms as they rely upon the kingdom of Jesus. Many 
but not necessarily all. The Beatitudes are lists of human lasts who at the individualized touch of the kingdom of God become divine firsts. The gospel of the kingdom is that no one is beyond beatitude because the rule of God from the heavens is available to everyone. Everyone can reach it and it can reach everyone. Now we respond appropriately to the beatitudes of Jesus by living as if they are true not only of us, but of those around about us. Now let's make this message personal. Who is on your list of the blessed? You're walking in the good news of the kingdom. If you can go to any of the most hopeless people around about you and with confidence assure them that they can be blessed through the kingdom of heaven, that they can now enter into the blessed life with God. So who is on your your list of the hopeless blessables as found in today's world? Now, there's a silly side to this question that becomes kind of serious really quickly when you start to think about it. But the silly side, the media, the culture of our day, the advertising, says who are the blessed who are the blessed people according to advertising it's the the beautiful right the beautiful people the sexy ones the unfortunate are the fat the misshaped the bald the ugly the old those who are not reset, relentlessly engaged in romance and sex now unfortunately in our culture particularly for our teens and young adults drift into life where being thin and correctly shaped, having gorgeous hair, appearing youthful and so forth, are the only terms of blessedness and woe that they know. That's what they experience. They hear nothing else. And we often find ourselves outside the limit of human acceptability. Dallas Willard writes a beatitude for the modern world this way. Blessed are the physically repulsive. Blessed are those who smell bad, the twisted, the mishap, the deformed, the too big, the too little, the too loud, the bald, the fat, and the old, for they are all riotously celebrated in the party of Jesus. And then there are the seriously crushed ones, the flunked outs, the dropouts, the burnouts, the broke and the broken, the drug heads and the divorced, the HIV positives and the herpes ridden, the brain damaged, the incurable, the barren and the pregnant too often or the pregnant at the wrong time, the overemployed, the underemployed, the unemployable the swindled, the shoved aside, the replaced. The parents of children living on the streets and the children of parents not dying in the rest home. The lonely, the incompetent, the stupid, the emotionally starved and the emotionally dead, and so on and so on and so on. It's true that earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And that is precisely the gospel of heaven's availability that comes to us through the Beatitudes. And the good news is we don't have to wait until we're dead. Even the moral disasters will be received by God as they come to rely upon Jesus and count on him and make him their Lord. Murderers, child molesters, the brutal and the bigoted, drug lords and pornographers, war criminals, sadists, terrorists, the perverted, the filthy, and the filthy rich. Can't we sympathize with Jesus' contemporaries who huffed at him and said, this man eats with sinners. 
Sometimes I feel like I don't want the kingdom of God to be open to everybody and anybody. But it is. That's the heart of God. Now before we take communion, I want to play for you a song by Simon and Gar Garfunkel that is written based upon the Beatitudes. They figured out a long time ago what Jesus was talking about in these verses. Now there's a, f a couple of words that I need to explain. Soho, for example, is a section, a piece, a, a district in New York City. And a penny rooker is a, per, is a cheap swindler. People who swindle other people out of pennies. So let's uh, listen to their song. Some of us might feel at times uh, that the Lord has forsaken us. Because we're outside of what the world calls the blessed. According to the song... It uh, kind of gives a hint, I think. Why has the Lord forsaken them? What's the last line of the song? I have tended my garden, my own garden, too long. And I think that's the message of the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when you're outside of human blessability. But blessed are you when you stop tending your own garden. And come to Jesus. The kingdom has drawn near. We're, uh, we're ending the service by celebrating the Lord's Supper. And what the Lord's Supper is, is it's an invitation. It's an invitation to remember what Jesus has done for us so that we can be blessed. Where we remember that Jesus died after living a perfect life, a perfect life of obedience. And when we place our faith in him, and when we say we want to draw near to that kingdom, and we say, God, <laughs> I've tended my garden too long. I'm turning my life to you. When that happens, God takes Jesus' perfect right, uh, record of righteousness, transfers it to us, and we become righteous. And he takes our record of sin, transfers it to Jesus. And that's why he died in our place. This is how the last to become first and the first to become last. Jesus taught us saying, There is no need to be afraid, little flock, for it has pleased your Father to give you the kingdom. It has pleased the Father to give you the kingdom no matter who you are.